If you're anything like me growing up, TV has a special place in your heart. I remember staying home from school feeling sick while being lulled to sleep by an array of noises coming from the television perched on my dresser. Clicks of a mechanic wheel spinning while someone frantically answers questions or hearing a newscaster talk about the latest tragedy would often rock me to sleep in my teens. Today we wade through the dark back lots of Hollywood and your local TV stations. As I tell you about some of the disturbing cases where killers have actually appeared on TV. And no, this isn't a documentary list. This video will showcase some serial killers or murderers who managed to be captured on TV in some way, initially not relating to their crimes. A quick mention before we start is the BTK killer appearing on his local news about an animal attack in the area. I didn't count it because it didn't seem so significant, but found it was still worth mentioning. On May 28, 1989, the United Kingdom's ITV network would air an episode of the game show Bullseye, not knowing that they'd be broadcasting an infamous guest to the public. A man by the name of John Williams Cooper was a contestant on the show in a losing effort. What was unknown to the public was the history this man actually had. Unbeknownst to everyone, Cooper had been a repeat criminal. He had been a burglar and eventually made his way to armed robbery. On December 22nd of 1985, a mere four years before his appearance on the show, he actually committed his first double murder. At Scoviston Park, Cooper had descended upon a three-story farmhouse and murdered two siblings, Richard and Helen Thomas, in what was described as a robbery gone wrong. Their bodies were found charred with their hands tied after a house fire had been set to dispose of evidence. This wasn't his only time killing, though. A month after his appearance on Bullseye, Cooper struck again. About six miles from his last murder in Pembrokeshire, Peter and Gwenda Dixon were both shot in the face with a shotgun, point blank after being robbed. Gwenda's body had shown signs of slow assault and both of them had their hands tied behind their back. Two years before he was caught, he had also been charged with being a lost sale chasing a pair of teenage girls while at gunpoint. He was jailed in 2009 where, due to new testing methods on the evidence, he was charged with both the double murder cases of the Thomas siblings and the Dixons, as well as all the crimes he committed. His game show appearance was actually used in comparison to police sketches to help convict him. He is currently serving his life sentence. might find him skydiving or motorcycling, please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Who says that love isn't easy to find? At least that's what Cheryl Bradshaw, a contestant on the 1970s game show The Dating Game, thought. Little did she know that the man behind the privacy screen she chose was Rodney Alcala. After the show, Cheryl refused to go out with him even though he had won the date. This decision was more than one that likely saved her life. While Rodney Alcala on the show was charming and quick-witted, the real Rodney Alcala was a dark, disturbed monster. In 1968, Alcala had been seen by an eyewitness luring an eight-year-old girl into his apartment where he savagely beat and buried her. He had also strangled a 23-year-old flight attendant named Cornelia Curley in her apartment which strangely went unsolved until 2011. He had fled for three years under a false name, and he was arrested in 1971 after being recognized on his college campus. He was only served an assault charge as the family of the girl didn't want to testify against Alcala at the trial, collapsing the entire prosecution's case. After his release, he was jailed on and off again due to assault crimes of women and children. 
He began taking photos of his victims in very chesty explicit positions under the guise of a model photographer. It's theorized and actually confirmed in one case that he used this to take advantage of multiple children, including when he knocked a 15-year-old girl unconscious and bearded her. At a time without background checks, Alcala made his way onto the dating game TV program, and eventually charmed the bachelorette Cheryl Bradshaw into a date. She immediately called into the studio and refused to go on a date because he gave her a bad vibe, and that he was a creep. Frustrated by rejection, Alcala took out his anger on his victims. He murdered Robin Samos, a 12-year-old girl who had been snatched between her local beach and her ballet class in Huntington Beach, California. After a police sketch was seen by his parole officer, Alcala was sentenced to death twice, but appeals nullified the verdict. This was even with the evidence of Samos' earrings being found in a storage locker registered to Alcala. All in all, Alcala is said to have claimed anywhere from 8 victims to over 130 due to the unidentified photographs of his potential victims. As of now, only one family has identified a photo of their missing daughter. He was sentenced to death for five separate murder charges, but is yet to be executed due to a hold on all executions in the state of California. He currently serves the sentences in Corcoran State Prison in California. At approximately 6.15 p.m. on August 4, 2002, 10-year-old friends Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman were walking to a local sports center to get some snacks for the night. They never made it home and were reported missing three hours later. As everyone was looking for the missing girls, many news outlets began speaking to the man who claimed to see them last alive. This was Ian Huntley. In reality, as he gave the interview, he began to appear pale and nervous. Bigger evening in. You're the school caretaker. The girls, Jessica and Holly, would know you, and they saw you on the front doorstep. What what went on? Well, the girl, I don't know the girls. Um, I was still on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was, as she used to teach them at St Andrews. Um, I just said she weren't very good, as she hadn't got the job, and they just says, "Please tell her that we're very sorry." And, uh... This set police off to investigate him and his girlfriend. Maxine and Carr, who was a teaching assistant at the school as well. Wells and Chapman's burned bodies were found by the Lake and Heath Royal Air Force Base in an irrigation ditch. Due to them seeing the girls last, Ian's suspicious behavior and the girls' burned clothes being found in a school garbage can, the police took Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr in and charged them. Huntley was found guilty on two counts of murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 40 years served. After feeding him a false alibi, Maxine Carr was sentenced to three and a half years imprisonment for perverting the course of justice. She was eventually released and changed her name. The most disturbing thing about this interview is the fact that Ian Huntley seems so believable. This man had gotten away with lying for so long and had a criminal history that didn't even bring him into question until the trial. I do believe that Maxine got off light though. In an interview with Marion Clift, who was their neighbor, she stated that when Maxine had returned, she and Huntley had been seen standing in front of their vehicle's trunk. A very pale Huntley was seen staring into the trunk while Carr had been crying with her head down. When they had been seen knowing that they had been watched, Huntley quickly slammed the trunk. It seems to me like Maxine knew more than she was letting on potentially. This case is equal parts familiar and disturbing. The case of Laura Giddings' murder is a heartbreaking one to say the least. In June of 2011, Laura Giddings was a law student that was one bar exam away from completing her dream. Unfortunately, she never would. Her friends began searching for her as she had been missing for days. 
After a friend used a spare key to get into her apartment, they found that her keys, wallet, purse, and ID were all still there. Immediately, her sister Caitlin Wheeler called the police. Friends and authorities began searching for her throughout the campus, but only found something more disturbing. In the dumpster, there was a limbless, headless torso. Immediately, the police began questioning everyone, including a friend of Lawrence named Stephen McDaniel. He gave an interview to the news and, well, let's just say he seemed... I guess the word is worried. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched where she is. I mean, what about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard any, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? Right. I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's why we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. been studying for the bar? Yeah, I no one had seen her since Saturday because I we all just there's not a whole lot of interaction unless we're doing classes. Right. And she was doing the online version of it. You all so, study together though? I yeah, we were in there's there's two different people that there's two companies that provide you can just hold on there. Yeah, she's from Maryland. Yeah, I mean, she she was from up in Maryland. I mean, all her family was there, as far as I know. I mean, she. What's going on in your mind right now? Like, what are you thinking? Why would anyone do this? You didn't hear anything. No. You didn't see anybody? I. <laughs> Yeah, I just heard something. Maybe I could have helped. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Needless to say, McDaniel didn't seem very innocent. He was arrested after the dumpster was examined for more evidence. In a stroke of luck, the garbage truck hadn't emptied the dumpster yet due to running late. All the evidence needed was there, and had the trunk come by on time, the police theorized this case may have never been solved. This was also coupled by a search of McDaniels' computer, a pair of Giddings underwear, and a flash drive containing hundreds of private pictures of her. A cover for the hacksaw he used to dismember her was recovered as evidence as well. But the most damning piece of evidence was a video that was deleted from a camera in his possession. In it, he was seen stalking her from her window, recording her. It was also found out that Giddings had confessed to a friend a year prior that she had seen things moved around her apartment. Not only was McDaniel a murderer, but he was also a stalker as well. McDaniel pleaded guilty to murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment with no chance at parole. He is currently serving in Valdosta State Prison. On October 12, 1972, Ed Edwards became a contestant on the show to tell the truth, where he used his criminal background to be identified in the game. He also appeared on another game show called What's My Line. Unfortunately, I can't find any footage of that. Edwards claimed at the time that he was a reformed criminal and a motivational speaker who learned from his mistakes. They look up to you. Uh, no, when I was released from the reformatory, uh, they looked up to me and this uh, motivated me to go on to bigger things because this is why I was out there committing the crime was for the recognition. Mm-hmm. 
And this happens because a lot of thing, people think it's a big shot thing to do, huh? Uh, yes, this is the, uh, they feel, the more trouble you get into, the uh, bigger you are in their eyes. Well, I in 1961, he was placed on the FBI's most wanted list for multiple burglaries. After being paroled in 1967, Edwards tried to go straight until he committed a double murder in 1977. Working as a handyman nearby a wedding reception, Edwards had beer with 19-year-old Kelly Drew before strangling her and stabbing 19-year-old Tim Hack in a field in Jefferson, Wisconsin. These were dubbed the Sweetheart Murders, and while he was questioned, he was never detained or charged until almost 29 years later. His DNA was found on Drew's underwear, which eventually led to him being arrested in 2009, with a conviction shortly after in 2010. He soon after agreed to plead guilty to the murders of Billy Lovaco and Judy Straub from a 1977 murder case that hadn't been solved yet. He also confessed to the murder of Danny Law Glockner with an intent to collect life insurance as he was a family friend. He was sentenced to death in 2011, but died in prison that April. Watching back the footage, it's truly sad knowing that he had tried to get his life together, but seemed to never be able to put his life of crime behind him. This pattern of relapse leads some investigators to believe that Edwards may be involved with not only the Zodiac killings, but the murder of John Benet Ramsey. Although again, this is all purely speculation. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a like, a comment, or even subscribe if you feel like it. Remember that you're loved. And I look forward to broadcasting to your screens yet again next time. Sleep tight.